however you want to do that today, and however comfortable you are, we'll go ahead and do that. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born in His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Lost in His love. falls, it won't freeze them. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. So I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a Your victory, I'm gonna see a victory. 
Can't say what the enemy meant for you, and he turned it for good. He turned it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I was enjoying the worship so much, I just thought it would go on. <laughs> I forgot I was next. <laughs> well, we're going to continue the little series about being free in Jesus. And, and today, I want to use Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. If you turn there, please. Romans chapter 12. Beginning at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasant, and perfect will. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We're thankful, uh, God, that no matter what happens in this world, we can always count on you to bring us victory. We can count on you to be with us through thick and thin, through good times and bad, and that you will always bring us out on the other side of victory. We didn't have to fear anything, even death itself, because you conquered the grave and gave us that victory as well. Thank you, God. We have every reason to worship you every minute of every day. Amen. Now, God, we're going to turn to your word now and, and, and talk about being free in Jesus. And uh, just tell me, God, to have clarity of thought and speech and all of us to have ears to hear what you would say to your church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in the previous chapter, which is Romans 11, Paul does a great discourse about the grace and the mercy of God that has been extended not only to his people, the Jews, but also to us Gentiles. Then, after he finishes that exhortation about God's mercy and grace, he says in verse 1 of our text, in light of God's mercy, or because of that mercy, because you've got that mercy, he says, I urge you, urge you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Now, to be a sacrifice uh, conveys a notion of complete surrender, doesn't it? Sacrifice, you may put them on the altar and kill them, right? So sacrifice as an image 
has to do with total, complete surrender. And the word holy is the same. Uh, one of the senses in the meaning of holiness means totally and irrevocably given or surrendered to God. Now, we are never going to do that. We're never going to surrender to God uh, until we are convinced of what Paul said about God in Romans 11, that God is merciful, that God loves us, Amen. and that God will cause all things to work for our good, for our ultimate good. Now, until we're just convinced of that, living in obedience to God, surrendering to God's will and the word of God, uh, we, we're just not going to do it until we believe that. But we also believe that surrendering to God will result in the abundant, full life that Jesus promised. Until we believe all these things, we're never going to sacrifice ourselves to God. Now, notice that Paul did not say, present your spirit or your soul, or your body, soul, and spirit. He said, present your bodies. You know, for Christians, our bodies are the temple of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the place where God resides in the world that we live in. So if the world is ever going to see the kingdom of God lived out in the flesh, it's going to have to be through us. Now understand that the kingdom of God, when I say the kingdom of God, I'm talking about the reign and rule of God in human life. Nowhere else to go. Now, until Jesus, the kingdom of God was just the theory. You see, because no one had ever been able to do it. No one had ever been able to live in this world with its evil, with its temptation, with the devil loose in it. Nobody had been able to live out the kingdom of God, to live in perfect surrender and obedience to God. So until Jesus, it was just a theory. But now Jesus has made it a reality. He has showed us the kingdom of God can reside in human flesh, and he has sent the Holy Spirit to live in us to equip us to do just that. We are not to be Christian just in our thoughts and our attitudes, but we're to be Christians in how we live our lives. Now, Paul continues that we should no longer present ourselves to the world. Now, when he says world, he's talking about the evil that's in the world. And who is the God of this age or this world? The devil. And so there is evil in this world. I don't have to convince you of that. So he says, do not present yourself to the world to be uh, conformed to its patterns of behavior, but rather present yourselves to God to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he says you can know and do God's will with your bodies. Well, let's talk a little bit just about how it works. Now, the first key word is truth. You'll remember when we started this series, we used John 8, 31 through 36, and Jesus said, if you are truly my disciples, you will remain in my word, and you will Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, bondage in this context of personal freedom is most often the result of believing a lie. We have to understand that a lie is just as powerful as the truth if we believe it. So a lie is just important, just as powerful as the truth if we believe it. Our minds are a lot like computers. Now, a computer is nothing but an organized pile of metal and plastic. That's all it is. Uh, and it has some unique capabilities because of its CPU, which means central processing unit. And that's just a connection of memory chips which you're made out of sand, if you can believe that. They process sand to make those things. 
But you know, you can't do anything with the computer at all. It's just a hunk of metal until it's been programmed. First, it has, has an operating system. And that establishes a system of communications that enables it to do certain basic functions and also to respond to certain commands and instructions from what we call computer programs. Now, once a computer is properly programmed, it can do a variety of things for us that we couldn't do ourselves. It can do very high-speed mathematical computation. It can assemble, store, and then search, retrieve, and process or print all kinds of information. It can send and receive several different kinds of communication. Now, the frustration comes is when it does something other than what it's supposed to do. Now, any of you that use computers know the frustration of that when it adds, when it's supposed to subtract and it prints on the wrong line. Or maybe what really gets me is when it just locks up and won't do anything. You got to shut it off and start again. Now, the problem in there might be with hardware. Some part may be broken or defective, but most of the time it, it's the software, the programming that's the problem. Now, in computer technology, the software, that we would say, has a bug or a glitch, so every now and then it does something weird it's not supposed to do. And uh, so in the early days of computer science, it was called GIGO, G-I-G-O, which is an acronym for garbage in, garbage out. You program a computer with garbage, you're gonna get garbage out. Now for humans, our hardware is our body, and our CPU is our brain. When we malfunction or we act or react in society that, that in a way that's not uh, considered within the range of normal, it can be a hardware problem. Uh, physical illness or injury, medications, chemical imbalances can, can make us behave abnormally. We've probably known people who have experienced that. Maybe we've done it, experienced it ourselves. But most of our malfunctioning, I'm convinced, is a software problem. We have a bug or a glitch in our programming. You see, when we were born, we already had an operating system. It was already in place. And we could hear, see, smell, feel, taste, eat, and process food. And we could make audible sounds. So we are computer, all ready to go. All we need to do is be programmed. But from the moment of our birth, we've been in the process of being programmed. You understand what I'm getting at? Yeah. Our brains are like those memory chips in that computer. Everything that goes through here gets stored somewhere, even things you can't even remember. And all of that information can affect how we think, feel, and act. Parts of it that we have accepted as truth affects our personality as well as our behavior. Now, some or maybe a lot of this programming which controls how we think, act, and relate to God and others came from where? The world. The TV programs us. Our interaction with others programs us. The music we listen to programs us, you see. And a lot of that came from the world. And, uh, and some and maybe a lot of it is garbage. Yeah. And when you get garbage in, what do you get out? Garbage. garbage in, you get garbage out. Now Paul says that we should let God change our programming by replacing the world's lies with his truth. Now, some of us here today, I know I do, still have some garbage in there. Uh, as a result of negative experiences uh, or lies that we've been taught to be true. And we get these lies all the time. You know, even in church. Do you realize that? Godliness, cleanliness is next to godliness. You ever heard that in church? I have. But it's not in the book. Abraham and... and uh, that bunch and Moses would not have been clean by our standards. They didn't take a bath or two every day. 
They maybe got one once a week. So, so we, we've been taught things that aren't true. God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that one? Amen. Yeah, but it's not in here. My Bible says God helps those who help others. Well, God wants to reprogram us. He wants us to present our bodies to him as living sacrifices so he can reprogram us by the transformation of our minds. So he can change our thinking. So we can live like people of God who have the spirit of God living in them. Now here's how it works. First of all, we gotta, we got to decide what our standard for truth is going to be. Now, Paul uh, probably would not have said exactly what I'm going to say because he didn't have the New Testament. He was, he was writing it. But I believe I can say for Paul and for me, the Bible is my standard of truth. If anything contradicts what is clearly revealed in Scripture is a lie. Uh, now, and, and uh, if, if I don't believe that the Bible is the authoritative standard of the word of the living God instruction to us, then I don't know how to know what the truth is. Except trying to figure it out by myself. And that scares me to death. So my standard is the scripture. Now I realize that not all script, all teaching you hear in church is not biblical. You understand that, don't you? There's splinter groups out there that teach things that just, just aren't right. But if I can read it in this Bible and understand it, whatever is clearly revealed to me, that's the truth. Now, we have to understand that truth is not the same thing as objective reality. For instance, the color of that piano case right there is what? It's black. Now, our society, a society as a, as a whole all over the world, has determined that things that look like that would be called black. Now, we could have called it green or yellow, but we didn't. We called it black. And everybody knows that that's black. So everybody's in earshot with me that's not colorblind would look at that and they would agree with me that that piano case is black, right? That's objective reality. It is black and it should be black to everyone who can see. Now, but if I say, if I, that's what if I say that piano is black, but now what if I say God loves you? It's a totally different thing, isn't it? Even though what I said is absolutely true, we're no longer operating in the realm of objective reality, but subjective reality. What we think and what we feel and what we believe. The truth that God loves you will not help you unless you believe it with all of your heart. Amen. That you accept it as truth. So I've accepted that as truth. And, and I, don't, I don't care what happens to me. If tomorrow they string me up and horse whip me and beat me to death, I still believe God loves me, and I'm not changing that. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it, through thick or thin, and no matter what happens, I know that God loves me because it says so in the book. Now, your past experiences and your programming glitches may be screaming loudly that either God does not exist or even if he does, he certainly does not love you. But the book says he does, doesn't it? Yes, sir. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the whole kit and caboodle. But very specifically in Romans 5, 8, he says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So you don't have to clean your act up for God to love you. He already loves you. But he just wants you to believe that so you will come to him so you can experience his love and have the power to love him back and to love others. 
We must decide. We must choose who or what we are going to believe. If we choose to believe the Bible, the truth it contains will set us free to receive God's love so we are then able to love ourselves, our neighbors, and hallelujah, even our enemies. Yes. You know, it, it, it was a good, one of the good, best feelings I ever had was quit hating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, try, I try to do things that show that I love people, even though I'm I, against everything they say or they believe in. Now, what I am saying is very simple, isn't it? Believe the truth, it gets inside of you, and you're set free from whatever is making you behave abnormally because of the lie you believe. It's very simple, isn't it? It's not complicated at all. But that being simple doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. You know? Uh, bench pressing a 400 pound barbell. <laughs> it's simple, the process to do it, but it's not easy. Now, the old patterns of thinking are so deeply ingrained in us, they have to be rooted out. And I, I wish people would understand that about the racial issues that we have. Because a lot of that stuff is ingrained in us. It's also ingrained against those we've abused. And that's, that's got to be rooted out. You can't just decide one day I'm not going to do that. You've got to work on it. We may have to quote scripture to ourselves over and over and over again, insisting and ordering our minds. That we're no longer going to live by the lie, but only by the truth of God. And we got to put our foot down yeah. and say, no, Jerry, you're not going to live that way anymore. You're not going to think that or believe that. You're going to believe what God said. And you have to work at it. But you know, in time, the truth will become so ingrained in us. And the process of it being ingrained, it will root out the lie. And to where the truth of God becomes the thing that motivates your actions. But it all starts with our getting to the place of really loving God and receiving God's love. Now Paul's instruction to us is stop believing the lies. Submit yourself to God for debugging for the transformation of your lives. Let God's truth Take up residence within us so it will begin to root out the lies. Then Paul says, we will be able to test and approve what God's will is. We will be empowered to live a life of love, of self-control, and godly, uh, godly discipline. In spite of all the circumstances of life and all the powers of hell, and everything they'll throw at us. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's some real good news. Do you agree? Amen. Clap your hands if you agree. Honk your horn if you believe. That is good news. But you know what? God didn't just say, come over here. I got a screwdriver, and I'll just fix you up and make you right. No. We have to cooperate with God in order to get our minds reprogrammed and transformed to where we automatically think and act by God's Word. We've got to get that Word ingrained in us. Let us pray. God, we are grateful for your Word. We're grateful for your commitment to us. Lord knows, God, I'd have given up on me a long time ago. But you keep at it. You're persistent. And you keep trying to get me, oh Lord, to submit myself fully to you that I can be transformed. Thank you, Lord, for the progress I've made. And thank you, God, for the confidence I have that you won't bail out on me. That you'll stay with me until the job is done. 
The one who called is faithful. And he will complete the work that he's begun in us until the day of Jesus Christ. Ingrain that in our hearts, Lord, so that we can live in hope and we can live in your power, that we can see your love and mercy spread in the world around us. Come, Lord, fill our hearts this day and let it be if you can show us something we're holding back, something we're holding on to that's not of you. Give us the grace, Lord. Give us the power to lay it on the altar. To let it all be given to you. That we might walk in truth. And that truth will liberate us. And set us free to be all that you created us to be. Come, Lord Jesus. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore me. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to this earth you created, all for love's sake became.